Hi folks, Dr. Tom Mead, welcome to another edition of our show. We have a very interesting and complex topic today to discuss. One of the things that drives me crazy in medicine is false advertising, hype and advertising. And let me tell you, it's rampant in the foot and ankle world. Almost everybody at one time in their life will suffer from painful foot and ankle disorders. And I can't open the paper any day and see ad after ad of treatments for foot and ankle problems. I really think that as a profession, we have to be very honest with our patients. I've assembled a panel of foot and ankle experts to help you honestly answer the questions in the foot and ankle world. Before I introduce them, I have to tell you that I cut out some articles from the paper just this week to emphasize the point. Um, number one, we've successfully restored sensation and strength to patients who've been suffering from pain and discomfort of peripheral neuropathy. Microvas, a new physical therapy treatment that reduces pain. It simply takes 45 minutes three times a week for 12 weeks, 36 visits with no side effects. It absolutely drives me crazy. Anything that preys <clears throat> on vulnerable patients for foot and ankle pain, and it may or may not work, I'm not saying that, but I think without medical evidence, it really misleads the public. How about this one? Hypercure stent. I have no clue what that is. I thought it was Tony Pan Bianco's a stent for the heart. Anyway, hypo cure stent. And the first word is neck strain, shoulder ailments. I mean, they're trying to tell you that some surgical implant in the foot is going to treat your neck strain. This is in the paper this week. And it can be performed on patients as young as three years old. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. I mean, this is nuts. I mean, this ranks up there with my, uh, my statin uh, speech on giving it to kids because they're, you know, they're overweight. Heel pain. I mean, you know, it's, I, don't, I don't do foot and ankle anymore, although it disappoints Dr. Wapner, who tried to get me into that field. But how many people come in and, you know, they have this impression that heel pain comes from a bone spur? You know why? Because it's easy to say that. Because in your mind, you say, I have a spur that sticks down like a, like a nail. I walk on it and, and it hurts. Let's take that spur out. But in reality, we're 90 degrees off reality. A spur doesn't go down and it goes sideways. And that's not the cause of the pain. It's the result. And here's a big article that says it treats inflammation. And my whole panel could probably say that <clears throat> the pathology of plantar fasciitis is more micro tears rather than inflammation, which is why a lot of Advil and the anti-inflammatories and even the injections of cortisone aren't that helpful. And then the, the last one, and I'll get to introducing my panel here, is the laser treatment of toenail fungus. So I, you know, I know nothing about it except that laser treatment of toenail fungus has been around for 10 or 20 years. It's never worked before. Maybe it works now. I don't know. But let me tell you, I'm very suspicious when I read a few things in the literature that says um, um, the only thing at risk is their financial status. Hmm. Because it costs 1000 to $1,500 a treatment. And as far as I know, there's no medical evidence that it works. So they're luring these people in with advertisements after advertisements. So that's just a taste of what questions you could, you could ask uh, our panel. Um, Coordinated Health Foot and Ankle Division is the largest, most respected foot and ankle division in the Valley. And I'll start with Lori Barnett right now. And I'll come back to Keith. Not to slight Keith at all. But, <laughs> but anyway, women first. And Lori is a terrapin trained at the uh, University of Maryland and was a big runner in, uh, in uh, her youth and presently. So she has a lot of uh, answers for any sports related questions. Steve Brigido, trained at Ralph, uh, yeah, Randolph Macon University. And uh, Steve is just awesome. He directs our residency program here. He runs a cadaver lab. He's huge into education. And so a uh, great guy next to him is one of my oldest friends and fellow Parkland High School team physician. When I first came to town, Eddie Schwartz out of East Stroudsburg. Uh, we treated athletes uh, for years up at Parkland and uh, Eddie still continues to, uh, to uh, proctor the running clinic at Coordinated Health. And next to him is uh, my good friend out of Princeton University, Jason Rudolph. And then Vanderbilt 
Uh, he trained at a fellowship and uh, talented uh, orthopedic surgeon who has a big interest in foot and ankle. So he's here to help answer the questions. And last but not least, Keith Wapner. And I'll have to tell you a little story about Keith. When I first met Keith, I was a first year resident at Jefferson and uh, Keith came from a temple, the University of Pennsylvania. He was a first year attending in foot and ankle. And the first day I was there, he uh, threw a book at me and said, Tom, I have to finish a chapter on metal toxicity and you got to write it. <laughs> and, I said, and he said, what do I know about it? He goes, as much as I do, but I don't have time. <laughs> and uh, anybody that was here uh, a month ago or so, we had a standing room only and a topic that I, that I thought was um, really mundane packed the audience here because of the metal toxicity of metal on metal hips. So, uh, Keith was uh, ahead of his time, but fortunately neither of us went into hip arthroplasty <laughs> surgery. But that's what cured us, <laughs> that chapter. <laughs> that's what cured us. But anyway, Keith is uh, a stellar foot and ankle. So he trained with the god of foot and ankle surgery, Roger Mann, out on the West Coast, and one of, one of the few uh, docs to come back to the East Coast. And he's really climbed that academic ladder. He has been the uh, president uh, of the American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society. So he's ascended the highest ladder in his field. So what a great honor to have uh, Keith and the rest of our staff here. And so, um, you know, with that introduction, I'm going to start and say, I've done a lot of joint replacements in my life. I've replaced shoulders, I've replaced hips, I've replaced ankles, and I've replaced knees. And I'll tell you, of, and right now I just do knees, but I'll tell you, of all those, I think the ankle replacement is one of the most complex procedures in orthopedics. I remember I've done three of them. One was on a policeman, a nun, and a lawyer. It took me three hours to read the night before after going to a, uh, a course, and my senior partner, Pete Keblish, got sick, and he used to do a lot of this, so he said, oh, no, Tom will do it, and I, you know, so anyway. But uh, it's come a long way, and I know um, two or three of the panel does a lot of ankle re replacements. I might start with uh, Keith, because I think you actually helped design one of the ankle replacements. Is that true? I, didn't, I helped design the instrumentation to put it in. Uh, the ankle replacement that I do, it's called a STAR ankle. It stands for Scandinavian Total Ankle Replacement. In total ankles, it's a little different than some of the other fields in joint replacement, because the ankle is a much more difficult joint. If you do a total hip, you know, the, the hip is sitting there isolated. There's no joints above it or below it, you know, for quite a distance. You do a total knee, it's the same thing. You do a total shoulder. The problem with the total ankle is that you're doing the ankle, which is primarily an, a hinge joint to do up and down motion, but also has some rotation. But it sits about two inches above a joint that does side to side motion, and it sits about two inches behind a joint that does back and forth motion of your foot. And so it's really, you're putting a hinge almost above a ball and socket joint. Um, so it makes it a much more complex joint because I'm, when you're designing a total ankle, you have to take into consideration not just the ankle morphology itself, but the surrounding joints below it. And then you have to take into account all the planes of motion that have to go on. So it becomes much more complex. Um, the other issue with an ankle joint that makes it more difficult than a hip or a knee is if you think about the amount of weight and force that goes through your ankle. You know, in physics, they talk about a lever arm. You know, a lever arm basically is the distance between the weight and where you're holding it. It's like if you take a broom. If you pick a broom up right before the head, it's very easy to pick it up. If you pick a broom up at the very end and you try to pick it up, that broom seems much more heavy. Well, that's the lever arm. And if you look at the way the body is set up, you have that ankle on top of this lever arm of the entire body weight. So if you're five feet tall and you have a head that weighs about 20 pounds, the pressure that you're putting on the foot is that five foot lever arm times that 20 pounds. And if you think about the weight that goes across the ankle joint, it's much higher than the weight of the hip or the knee because of that. And then to make it even more complicated, if you look at the surface area of the ankle joint, it's much smaller. So you have a smaller surface area with much greater weight going across it, with much greater forces going across it in a situation that's much more unstable than other joints. So that's you know, those are the things that make it much more complex. So it, it's a, you say it's a very complex situation. Very complex. And one of the problems with Americans today, we know, is the overweight or the obesity problem. And hips or knees, we always ask the question, is somebody too heavy for a hip or knee re replacement? I'm going to ask the same question in ankle surgery to Dr. Uh, Brigido. And are there alternatives? What's the alternative to an ankle replacement? 
So stick with us, we'll find out the answer right after this message. Welcome back folks. Can you be too heavy for an ankle replacement? And what are the other alternatives to ankle replacement that have been around for many years? Dr. Brigido. Well, thanks Dr. Mead. You know, the, the the ankle replacement can be a successful procedure, but we feel that one of the most important reasons why ankles will be beneficial and, and, and people have, will, po will have a positive result is their size. You know, patient selection is key to having a successful joint replacement. When patients do have a body size or shape that isn't conducive to having a, a long-lasting ankle prosthetic put in, uh, there are alternatives. Those alternatives are things such as ankle fusion which when people hear the word fusion, they often get uh, concerned because they feel, well, I'm not gonna be able to walk comfortably. Well, arthrit when arthritis occurs, it's bec uh, one of the results of that arthritis is a narrowing of the joint space and an increase in friction and grinding of that joint. So when you take a step, your ankle bones are literally, for lack of better terms, grinding and causing pain. What a fusion does is by taking those bones and actually fusing them together utilizing hardware, we can actually prevent that grinding we can allow the patient to ambulate with a nice, nice stiff ankle joint that allows them to propulse off of that leg. It allows the pain to be eliminated and they can function quite well. Now it is a procedure that does require the patient to, to, to rehab extensively after the fusion heals. It is something that we want our patients to work on their gait training. We want them to be able to, to strengthen the muscles that have not had, had been used because of the arthritis that's occurred. Uh, but when patients come into the office a year or so after, after an ankle fusion, many of them will come in without, with a very small hitch in their step or even no limp at all. Patients can function very, very well. They can do many of the activities that they couldn't do when they had an, you know, a painfully arthritic ankle. So you know, when you think about the alternatives to, uh, to ankle you know, replacement or arthroplasty, an ankle fusion is certainly a great option. Dr. Rudolph, are there age limits? Are you too young or can you be too old for an ankle replacement? Well, I, I think that the age question is a, is, a, is a vital question when it comes to ankle replacements. And, and just to go take a step back, we know that folks that get hip or knee arthritis are usually wear and tear. In general, generalities over 60 into their 70s. Unfortunately, the ankle arthritis population is a lot younger. And that's because the ankle is not necessarily a joint that wears out, while most of the time the people that get ankle arthritis are folks that have had major fractures about the ankle. Uh, and those occur not when you're in your 60s or 70s, you'll, you'll have a terrible injury to the ankle in your 20s or 30s. Then the arthritis sets in in your 40s or 50s. So we all know that any joint replacement, hips, knees, it's metal against plastic most of the time, and plastic and metal wears out and there's only a certain amount of cycles until that metal and plastic wears out. So if you're talking about putting metal and plastic in 40 and 50 year olds, that's a big consideration is how long is that metal and plastic going to wear? You're more active in your 40s and 50s, so that's more cycles against that prosthesis. So age is not only a problem in that the folks that come with ankle arthritis are usually in the younger age group, but also, like Dr. Wapner was mentioning, there's a lot more forces that go across a smaller uh, area and all that adds to increase wearing and the question of how long are these prostheses going to last. I know in your total knee population we're talking 30 year knees now um, and we're hoping ankles haven't been out that long. The newest ones that, that Dr. Wapner is working on haven't been out that long so we just don't have the data to say how long are these things really going to last. I have a stellar panel of five surgeons but you know what the most important thing about foot and ankle surgery? is that the majority of foot and ankle pain does not require surgery. And the question I have for uh, Dr. Schwartz is, many patients will have ankle pain and they said, you need an orthotic. You need, how do they get evaluated? What's the difference of the over-the-counter orthotics? Do they work? They cost 20 bucks. How about custom orthotics? They cost two or $300. Is there a difference? Is there proven efficacy? How do they sort that out, where to spend their health care dollars? It's a great question um, because most people that come in the office with foot pain have already tried uh, some over-the-counter type of, of remedy. Um, when you evaluate a person with foot pain, there's so many things that need to be considered. Uh, the overall body shape of the patient, the way their foot functions, um, the age of the patient. Uh, things that we 
the, the panel has just talked about with, with replacements. Um, how tight are their muscles? How loose are their muscles? Are their tendons still functioning properly? So all these have to be considered when you evaluate a patient for foot pain. Um, as Dr. Mead said, a good percentage of the people that we see never require foot surgery in order to, to uh, reduce or, or alleviate their discomfort. Controlling that person's foot mechanics can be the biggest thing in terms of alleviating pain. Um, in addition to using a support inside the shoe, addressing the, the muscle tightness, stretching exercises, strengthening exercises are things that can be just as effective. The type of shoe that a person wears is crucial in, in terms of, uh, of treating foot pain. When you have a, a five foot two female who weighs 200 pounds and comes in with flip flops and wants to know why their foot hurts, well, it's, it's, an obvious, it's an obvious situation, but people don't want to address that sometimes. Some of the over-the-counter orthotics can be quite effective. There's some, uh, uh, using a, uh, an arch support inside the shoe with a good shoe can alleviate some of the pain. Um, the custom orthotic is, a, is an orthotic that is molded to a person's foot. So obviously it's gonna have a better fit for that individual. The type of orthotic that's prescribed varies. There are some that are very soft and there are some that are very rigid. And it all depends on what we're trying to accomplish when we use a product like that. Laurie, I have a, uh, a daughter that uh, ran for Ohio State and then uh, she saw the light and she's transferred to Penn State and now she runs for Penn State. So, But anyway, as Dr. Wapner said, the um, the forces across the foot are tremendous when you're walking, but when you're running, they have to exceed that by several multiples. How do runners know when to get orthotics? How often is it, is it helpful? Is it trial and error? Is it the same thing that Dr. Schwartz said? Do you have to evaluate them differently? Is it weight-bearing evaluation? And is it a rigid or a soft, a soft orthotic that's better for runners? What's your experience both with yourself and in the running population? Well, I find that people who run are at, at, have a different mindset of how they're using their feet. Obviously, they're, they're, they're concerned about their stride length and their intensity of their running. And, you know, people aren't worried about how fast they go through the mall. They just want to get through the mall, uh, you know. But runners have a lot of um, demand on the feet that are different. A functional orthotic usually is something that's... Um, a process that we work with the patient. We don't just um, start with something, see how it goes. We, we want to make sure that the patient is responding to the orthotic, that they're getting the relief, and that it's not causing any other problems. Uh, these people are highly sensitive to every body change and any change in their stride length, and they do need to find something that's going to work for their specific intensity and sport that they're doing. Thanks, Lori. And what I found out is a lot of these shoe companies really cut corners when it comes to the insert. You could take it out and fold it up in your hand like a piece of cardboard. So really, they almost depend on the runner getting a better insert. Well, and it brings up a good point because running shoes are getting more technical in the outsoles and how they're built up. So you have to consider the shoe with the orthotic. It's a, it's a whole process of, of, of um, evaluating the whole runner and the whole shoe that they're using. Where's the rotator cuff? Who knows where the rotator cuff is? Did you know there's a rotator cuff equivalent in the foot? You'll find out more about it right after this break. Folks, with time and age, a lot of rotator cuff tendons can wear out with time. There's a tendon in the foot which is not too dissimilar by analogy. It certainly doesn't move your shoulder, but it's called the posterior tib tendon. It's one of the biggest tendons in the foot next to the Achilles tendon. And what I mean is just, it's very, very common with age to have this slow wear and tear attrition, almost like a shoelace. And when I was doing general orthopedics or sports medicine, I really struggled with these patients that would come in for knee pain and they say, my knees are going out which really means their knees were going in, they're kind of knock kneed and then they said, and then you look at their foot and their heels are going out. And in reality, one of the biggest, strongest ligaments in the foot, um, I use the posterior tib tendon as a cadaver ligament to reproduce 
ligaments in the knee, but it's one of those ligaments that I just really struggled with because a lot of people come in when it's too late. It's like the rotator cuff. If you come in early and there's a little bit of wear, you can rehab it, you can strengthen it. But the same thing in the ankle, this posterior tib tendon, if you come in and it's so stretched out and attenuated and torn, and then folks want an orthotic to fix that darn thing. But Keith, over the years, we've, we've seen that. And what's the continuum of this disease? Yeah. So th this actually is the most common cause of an acquired flat foot in an adult. You may know somebody that says over the years, you feel like my arch has collapsed and they have difficulty then walking because of that. And it will usually begin with pain on the inside part of the ankle. That tendon comes down the back of the leg and inserts on the inside part of the foot. And its job in walking is if you think about your foot when you're walking, it's what creates an arch so that your foot can push off like a lever. When that tendon becomes stretched out or inflamed, over time people will begin initially complaining of pain on the inside part of their foot, around the ankle, the back part of the ankle, and then they'll notice it gets harder and harder to do simple things like trying to get up on my tiptoes to put something on the shelf, trying to go up the stairs, or even more difficult sometimes going down the stairs. And it's those things that require your foot to be essentially serve as a rigid lever rather than being supple so that you can't push off of it. So when those symptoms begin, it starts first, as, as Tom mentioned, it's an attritional tear of the tendon. And what that means is it's, it's basically it's wearing out. And the tendons are kind of like a braided rope. And when they start to wear out, like a braided rope, it unravels a little bit and it becomes thicker. And so patients will notice I've got this swelling behind my ankle on that medial side and it just seems hot and kind of warm and swollen. And what happens with that tendon, as it begins to unravel, it actually lengthens, just like a braided rope would start to lengthen as it unravels. And when it unravels, it loses its power. As that tendon stretches out, the muscle will start to contract, but it can't move the foot. And then the other muscles in the foot that work against it to pull the foot in an outward direction overpower it, and your arch gets progressively more collapsed. And your heel goes out, and so when you look at the person from the back, one heel will be this way, the other heel will be out like this. If it gets bad enough when you look at them when they stand and you look at their forefoot, one foot will be this way, the other foot will be sticking out this way and then you lose that power. So it, this continuum begins as a slow gradual process. If you catch it early, you can use a brace and some physical therapy and a lot of times heal that tendon, but if it gets too late, then you get secondary changes in the foot with stretching out of the ligaments, other ligaments in the foot and arthritis, and that's when you have to start thinking more about surgical alternatives. And a lot of people think that an orthotic could control that, but I don't think that's true. Is it, Keith? No, I mean, once, once your posterior tip tendon loses its function, especially if you get any secondary changes in the foot where there's a, a ligament, it's called the spring ligament, which really helps support the, the arch, if that starts to stretch out. It goes back to what we talked about in, in the, the ankle replacements. If you look at the lever arm of the body, which is so long, to try to put something on the foot that's going to control your side-to-side -side motion, it's not going to be able to do it. And so the reason we tend to use braces is if we're trying to control a hinge in this direction, the only way we can effectively control it is to get a brace that goes above the level of that hinge. So you have to go with something above the foot. So to truly accomplish you know, some type of control of that posterior tibial tendon, you've got to come above the level of that joint, that what's called your subtalar joint, which does most of that side-to-side -side motion. Once you get the tendon function back, an orthotic may be able to assist a tendon that that's, has decreased function, but it can't replace the function of that tendon. You know, when we grade posterior tib dysfunction, we, we call grade one where it's just swollen and inflamed, but not really torn. Grade two where there's some tearing, but not completely ruptured. Grade three is where the tendon's completely torn, and now you have some arthritis, but now you're getting to what's called grade four. And grade four is where it's now affecting the ankle joint as well. And when you get into that situation, you, you really have to, it's very complex because sometimes the options can involve a combination of a tendon replacement and an ankle replacement. It depends on whether or not you have bad arthritis in the joints below the ankle. Right? Or you may only be able to do fusion. So if you have bad arthritis in the joints below the ankle, which are called your subtalar and transverse tarsal joints, and the ankle joint, that becomes more complex. You may have to fuse the joints below the ankle to get the foot back to being in a normal arch, and then you may want to address the ankle arthritis with an ankle replacement, but we know in that situation 
that we're probably decreasing longevity of the ankle replacement because we're putting more stress on the ankle. So that, that's one of the areas in orthopedics and, and in foot and ankles in general that we're doing a lot of research on to try to come up with what's the best solution. That is, that's one of the most complex issues that we face. Thank you. Well, folks, that's a very, very quick half hour, and we've only touched the tip of the iceberg on painful foot and ankle disorders. We have an expert panel here. I want to thank them tremendously for their time but I'm actually gonna take executive privilege and invite them back for a second show. I think we've just begun to answer some of the questions. I'm excited to look at some other myths in foot and ankle pain, including high-heeled shoes, do they really cause bunions? And I wanna find out that answer on our next show. Folks, thanks for joining us. Please join us on our next show. We really appreciate your time.